Thank you. Um, it is a great honor to stand before you tonight to introduce someone um, that I am able to count as a teacher and a friend, especially since he is also one of my favorite poets. Bruce Smith and I met under the most dismal of circumstances. I was a freshman, and he was teaching the beginning poetry workshop that I wanted to get into, which naturally he didn't let me into. This was my first writer's lesson in rejection. <laughs> Resolving to wait for Peter Balakian to come back from sabbatical and offer the class again, I put Bruce Smith, his class, and his collection of weird stamps out of my mind. I can't remember if it was in the spirit of magnanimity or Quaker forgiveness that I went to Bruce Smith's reading at the end of the year, whether it was curiosity or whether I had just gotten it mixed up and thought that Mary Carr was reading that afternoon. <laughs> All I remember is sitting in the audience and hearing <laughs> after St. Vincent Millay for the first time. After hearing the famous last line, which I'm not going to give away, uh, do not let, let um, Bruce have that uh, pleasure, I knew two things at once. One, I had heard a great American poem, and two, I could never bear a grudge against the man who could capture the spirit, the spirit of petulance so well. By the time we met again at the conference last year, I had read his books so many times I was already nervous to meet him. Above all, afraid that he would remember me. <laughs> Although I insisted to Matt nevertheless that I be his intern. His first words were, oh, I remember you. You're the girl I kicked out of my class. <laughs> In fact, Bruce is a poet of the greatest breadth and re relevance. He is the author of five books of poems, The Common Wages, Silver and Information, which was selected for the National Poetry Series, Mercy Seat, The Other Lover, which was a finalist for both the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize, and his newest collection, Songs for Two Voices. He is currently a Guggenheim Fellow and has twice received grants from the NEA and the Massachusetts Arts Council. He teaches in the graduate writing program at Syracuse University. And veterans of his workshop at the conference know and love his idiosyncrasies. They find his stamps charming rather than weird. <laughs> and know that he has the gift to see where a poem is going even when we ourselves may have given up. And he champions each of his students with enthusiasm and patience, which is rare even among creative writing professors. It is striking how often critics cite the jazz-like quality of his lyric voice, describe his lines as riffs, and use a musical vocabulary as well as a poetic one to express the fine tonal qualities of his poems, as well as their mental and philosophical leaps that keep the intellectual activity of each poem as dynamic as the sound quality. But it would be no less correct to discuss his poems in terms of painting, photography, or especially, I think, using the language of film. He shifts scene and voice with cinematic precision, and his intermingling of image with history, ironic wit with personal experience, and music with tragedy gives the impression of documentary as much as it does of jazz. Just as important as the aesthetic richness of his poems is their use and manipulation of form. In poems at, such as After St. Vincent Millay and also The Sandwiches, he has created startling sonnets, which have challenged traditional sonetic meter, line length, and stanzas, while following the guiding principle of the sustained short poem with the ironic twist at the end, asking us to reevaluate what a sonnet is, and by extension, what the love poem is. His newest book, Song for Two Voices, is a formalistically ambitious project of coupled sonnets that are as challenging as they are rewarding and as disturbing as they are beautiful. His work has been to craft poems that are at once confessional, political, deeply embedded in high-end pop culture, aware always of their roots in music and in dance, and the voice he has developed is, above all, profoundly American. Please give it up for Bruce Smith. <laughs> So it's my, to my eternal mortification that I kicked Jasmine out of class. How did, how did I know that uh, someday she was going to be telling stories about me? 
and I want to say uh, happy to be the warm-up band for Karen Novak, the hardest working woman in show business, and really happy to do that on this same bill. And happy to be back at Shenango Valley. You know, it's, if I could have dreamed uh, a, an audience and a group of people, um, this is the kind of people I would invent, sort of my friends and uh, Matt Leone and my friends from Syracuse who are here, and, uh, and people I don't know who are interested in fiction and poetry, so it's, you know, it's a great thing, and Denise, and you know, coming to see. So, uh, happy to be back and uh, reading for you. Um, I'm going to read, uh, this is going to be the laughter one, I'm going to try to <laughs> do the laughter poems. Uh, and this isn't one, uh, this is a, this is a, an elegy in the key of R, I say, this is a, a poem where all the lines but one end in R, uh, and, that, and that sound of anger and continuance is one I want to play a lot. And the other thing you need to know is Emir, uh, in the continuing our tradition of the Arabic here, is, uh, is a, it's an Arabic word for commander. So Emir means, uh, you know, prince or chief or commander. It's another R word I wanted to get in there. Um, and le petit mort, you know, is this small death, that, which is, of course, what the French thought an orgasm was. And did I mention that, you know, to have Dee and Kathy here, too, is really a pleasure for me, too. So, um, this is his father in the exhaust of engines. All his life, I used my father to get somewhere else. The game, the shore, the power, the color, the middle class, the other side. When he bent over the maw of the Ford, the generator, the alternator, the plugs he muttered motherfucker into, the sputter and choke and dying spark, a fender in one hand, a frayed wire in the other, bent like a wanderer in the Middle Ages before a statue of the Virgin. I swore I'd never bow and scrape before the orders. He swore, softly and finally, the R's caught somewhere in the rivet and bloom of the engine, a coughed arum while we idled on the spur of Philadelphia, America, nowhere fast. A small purchase, a seizure, like what a moan and shudder is from a man tortured or bored or dying la petite mort. And I'm the son, ignorant of motor, but prodigal of fuel and air. I'm the emir of the four-cylinder, the chopped and channeled lord of Detroit and Japan. I floor it, my foot on his back, or his on mine, his face in the mirror, his death doubling me over. And I have to read this, and those who have heard this before, it's my little one-trick pony act, I'm sorry. But my religious education as a kid was going to see the Philadelphia Eagles play football on Sunday with my dad. And, uh, and it's kind of one of those, like, Robert Hayden's Loves Austere and Lonely Offices poems where, you know, I remember being there and then miraculously this uh, bag of sandwiches would appear, which, you know, is the provision make for men. You know, men are watching football and then, you know, the sandwiches appear. So, you know, it's, it's, it seems to be about that to me now. And uh, the uh, names Bidnerick, McDonald, and Jurgensen are the great... Philadelphia Eagle football players of the era, and you'll tell everybody later who, who they were. And uh, the only thing you need to know is the word obsequies is a funeral rite or ceremony, and it's there because it rhymes with cheese. <laughs> a whole big excuse to rhyme with cheese. Uh, the sandwiches. Uh, this is for Jasmine, who asked about this, and I'm sorry I kicked you out of class. You had sandals in January. I didn't think you were serious. You know? <laughs> um, whatever death 
was rolled into the cold meats, whatever cultures were diffused among the cheeses, whatever geography was fed into the lettuce, whatever drudgery and destiny were left in the wheat that made the two slices of white, whatever obsequies were performed in the onion, whatever was lovely in the tomato, whatever bomb was in the mayonnaise, or whatever inspirational verse was ground into the mustard, we swallowed and were saved. From our bad vantage in the seats of the buzzing amphitheater, Franklin Field Sundays, we watched the muscled men, the great Bidneric, McDonald, and Jurgensen, eagle-winged and padded and masked like Greeks, run to concussion. And what we saw was what our God was. Ooh. I'll read a poem from the new book, Songs for Two Voices, uh, available tomorrow morning before the craft talk. <laughs> Makes an excellent bar mitzvah gift. <laughs> and uh, alimony payment. <laughs> this is, um, I'm going to try this out on you. I don't know. I haven't read it before. Um, this is called Song with Spanish Shoes. And th these, are, these are songs, um, a song and then a counter song. A song that uh, maybe kisses the other song or turns away from it. Uh, or somehow intersects with it. So um, sometimes a, you know, a, a one that's sort of falsely confessional, where it uses I, and then another one that's he or she. So it's, you don't ever know which one's the real one. So I, this is a song with Spanish shoes. Ordering Spanish shoes out of the catalog of Ebony Magazine as a teenager, you know, to be, to be cool. <laughs> Self-styled, the pimp roll in pork pie hat, high boy collar and dago sweat from emerald bottles, the titillation of pegged pants, self-fondled bondage, worn to dandy, worn to bliss, so tight we had to take our socks off first, gartered like a renaissance prince, the voluptas of Spanish shoes ordered through the catalogs in ebony, whose names were Kabbalah of cool, kick and flash. The pleasure came in black and brown forms of dominate and bee, sissy and desaad, in calf and lizard, in genie we buffed and rubbed up into sea deep reflections of ourselves. The retributions of dance are politics, twitching in the unnamed face of the atrocious white of the tracks, the hair shirt of lawns, the merciless ice cream faces. We fashioned ourselves, the raw heeled strut, the pinch of pleasure from running the gauntlet through, but smoothly, the lower air the jerky sidewalks, the ruthless self-same blocks, the rapture of being wrong. Our faces, our necks shaved, girly like an armpit or crotch, when nicked, soothed by a styptic pencil, that rabid froth of <coughs> dad's blue blades. Our hair like Caesar's, tonsured, singe treatment and hot comb, a scalp scalding part to look other, to be snipped from that manifest, fisherless future of the West. From Philadelphia, we saw the Conestoga wagons as white slave ships. By style, by diet of god liver and onions, we slipped into the shoes of beauty, or we turned our backs on the serious that chucked us under the chin, a belt around the package, and we were fit for no school or work. Slashed characters in stripes and plaids, we could not be president, not with our tongues laced with the scars of our tribe. There's a second song. Sorry to go on. <laughs> Brought up by de Beauvoir after the war, 
I remember a bathtub outdoors with other darlings, a sitz bath that might have been a quarantine or glory, the sun in the warm water sloshing over the lip. Eisenhower dried us with his stiff white towel, bristling and stubbled like the beard of the father that left our skin compliant. Thus begins the disclosure, thus begins the beginning over again in the news of what everyone wants. It must be the someone else that events happen to, a murder by the jilted, an uprising, a blush. We learned tact, the compromise between the unruly and the absolute. It was a dance in which she led and she followed, backwards and in heels, a slavish life of spin and dip, unfallen, a life of recuperation from not falling. How did we become so decent? How did the thought creep in to our creases and ducts and tubes? How did we become so schooled? We let ourselves out of our hands, spilled out of both hands and the body and into the barracks, the factory, the semi-gloss white houses and the family. We must make a pact with a sad fat man. Um, this is called In the Absence of War. Today I will eliminate all the causes of war from my life, beginning with the rancors against the president and the other empresarios of power who promised to kick some ass and do so in my name. I will eliminate my name. I will speak softly and eliminate the stick. I'll dream small and often. I'll parry the thrust. I will conduct my intolerance like lightning into the earth. I will swallow a toad each morning for breakfast so that the rest of the day may taste less bitter. I will jilt the lover in me of petty advantage, bigoted favor. I'll limit my death without becoming the killer. Sure I will. Uh, this is called delinquent. No other note except Lawrence, Massachusetts. Justin knows Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, Milltown. I think it, you know, it maybe it does have a little introduction, and here it is. I was, uh, the, which is sort of the idea that um, even in your self removal from the world as a writer, uh, there's always seemed to be something that uh, calls your attention to the other world sometimes. A radio goes by, you know, playing Dream On by Aerosmith, you know, or uh, there's a glint off a bottle in the moonlight that's a sort of Chekhovian reminder of something else. Delinquent. Sometimes the gun is pointed at the temples when I want the silence its chambers can bring, and sometimes it turns itself on the evening to shoot out the imperial streetlights and the beautiful neon in emotionally neutral cafes whose redolent light is as difficult as smoke, as stammering language to hold. Now I can be delinquent in the dark, except for the star point flashing from the neck of the broken bottle on another century's mill dam in Lawrence, Massachusetts, where I hear looms like axes grinding with complaint into my temporary little hell. The sound is like the sharpening of my pencil. I turn and point down and away from myself. Was this the laughing one I was going to do? I forgot, I forgot, I forgot that part. Um, and this is for David Thoreen. And this is a, a couple poems in the voice of a woman who makes her living as a teacher. And it's so, so it's my homage to the broken music of high school and the compilation of stories. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I taught for a long time, but I, 
you know, and why couldn't I write about that? I mean, why didn't I do that? Until I had a colleague, and, uh, a female colleague who was sort of telling me her stories of teaching, and I said, oh, yeah, uh, so I, I, I stole her voice, uh, and she speaks about what it means to to be a teacher, you know, which is kind of dismemberment and uh, <laughs> love all sort of wrapped up into that. So she, she I'll read a couple. Um, so David, I, so I forget which ones now. Where's David? So where is that? You know, there's their, like, number four. Okay. So I'll read number one, I'll read the beginning. It's kind of, you know, it's the, all the, the teacherly idea that you come back in September, and, uh, and I never quite got used to that. Idea, you know, it's you know everything's dying. Um, you're you're back in September. You're having the kick off supper, uh, and you know the kids are back, and it's things are beginning, and everything's dying, and it's and it seems wrong. So, and you feel like the last literate person. You know, you ask your kids like, what are, what are you guys been reading over the summer? <laughs> you go like, reading. You know, <laughs> we saw Terminator Six. <laughs> a, a living, it's got a living. A, a, Recky says uh, teaching was the only profession that permitted love, and you know, <laughs> and then this voice feels that it's lo a lot less than that. <laughs> uh, it's just it's a, making a living. Uh, number one is September. Once it was summer, and the flies died trying to find something to stick their infinite eyes to, and the insects let off steam in mid afternoons before the rains came slowly and dyed everything a deeper hue. It was the end of bliss and the beginning of some comfort with its entourage of nap and soup, its gentle disease. It took courage then to remain hysterical and vain, soft and distempered as the ripening overnight tomatoes, melons and peppers. And they said nothing when they arrived at school after the months of glistening and ripping out the seams of the baked neighborhoods in their parents' Chevrolets, except maybe unbelievable. It was fall, and all they could say to the return to the world was unbelievable. <laughs> Number two is, my, is called my charges. Whatever era we're in, whatever undertaking, on their bookish other, annoying, post-historical, on the odor in their rose-scented yearnings. They'll be shocked one morning, the white fireball coming across the asphalt at them into remembering the gratuitous praises and humiliations of their schooling. One's bouncing a check, one's nursing a baby, one's got the figures for the first quarter's earnings, one packs a bag for Paris. One joins the Navy for tattoos. One lives with mother in antiseptic rooms. When they discover the marred and discarded text whose margins have the sketch of the bridegroom without the bride and the indelible names of the ex-lovers besides the vaginal and phallic signs of their innocent and vanished tribe. I believe passion can be learned, that you can prepare for it like the SATs. I consider myself a missionary to the suburbs, and my mission is to instruct in the capacity for fear and the ecstasy that comes from being bound. It will take a really long rope, I'm afraid, of great strength and expense to loop around the heads and hips of them all. I hope to wound each one of them before they become less tender, destined, and armed. I mean to show them films of wave motion and crematoria, and they'll grab ass and be bored in the back of the room, I know, when I darken it, sophomoric as always, but the speech they will use as they emerge from the dark will be mute to the inhuman and slurred. Everyone I know is terrified. Tunnels and bridges, viruses and knives, neutrons loosed into the asphyxiating bag of atmosphere. And the body, 
shocks of hair uprooted, a digit removed, the low-level jacuz of yourself, the survivor. There's a burning I go through without the blister and cinder, without ash. There's a shame, how dare I, concerning my concern for myself. You see what a noose it is. The secret is the children, the children won't redeem us. I was a child once, and I was afraid under the mother quilt and the sign of Aquinas. Now I'm the sister whose dread outweighs her faith and reason. Still, I can teach them my trembling, my obedience. Okay, and I have a final poem, which is, um, which is from this book, The Other Lover, which is a, a book of bitter American love poems. <laughs> about which my mother wanted to do an intervention on me. I said, Mom, you know, I make stuff up. You know, she said, yeah, now I know the real story. So. And this is um, in the voice of, in the style of Edna St. Vincent Millay, who, who I love for that kind of um, urbane, bitter, what did you call it, Jasmine? Magnanimous, no, some... No, no, uh, something bitter, something like um, that. her quality that you found in her. I, I like her as kind of like a tough film noir chick with, you know, smoking a cigarette. You know, she's uh, had uh, love affairs that have gone bad, and she has a really... I didn't realize how bitter until I read all the sonnets again, you know, and that quality was really... She has a sonnet, for instance, number 11, that begins, I shall forget you presently, my dear. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, which is a way to say, you know, I'm remembering you now, you know, and it's killing. So I love that quality. It's Catullan in a way. Um, whether or not we find what we are seeking is idle, biologically speaking, says Millet in another one. Your face, yours is a face of which I can forget the color and features every one. Um, <laughs> So I, you know, yeah. I, so I, you know, I do the I did the poem in her voice in a way, and actually language is hers in that uh, kind of Malay, tough, vulnerable, wounded, you know, somewhere in that place. When I saw you again, distant, sparrow-boned, under the elegant clothes you wear in your life without me. I thought, no, no, let her be the one this time to look up at an oblivious me. Let her find the edge of the cliff with her foot, blindfolded. Let her be the one struck by the lightning of the other so that the heart is jolted from the ribs and the rest of the body is nothing but ash. It's a sad, familiar story I wish you were telling me with this shabby excuse. I never loved you any more than I hated myself for loving you. And about that other guy by your side you left me for, I hope he died.